Planner, welcome to Apollo's Water. It's great to be with you. It's uh, the, the the waters are are pretty nice out here. <laughs> They're a lot of fun, but yeah, you important. are here just in time for our Christmas edition. And so today we're going to do the Fast Five Christmas Christmas edition. Are you ready? I I, I am ready. Okay, here we go. This is these are easy, just normal little Christian traditions here. But what's your favorite go to Christmas movie? Oh gosh, uh, my favorite go to Christmas is probably Charlie Brown <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> we try and watch that even with our kids who are in their twenties. Oh, that's a good little tradition. How about yeah. that? How about the next one then? Favorite Christmas Carol. Uh, let's see. What's my favorite Christmas Carol? Uh, come all you joy, joy to the world. Come all you faithful. All of those are just so good. I, it, yeah. That's the hard part is seeing some of these hymnals go away and people don't know how to sing some of these songs anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because some of it just depends on the mood that I'm in. If, you know, one service, it may be one hymn it may, and one service, it may be another. It's always been actually something with me with, with music. Uh, a lot of it is determined um, by sort of seasons in life, moments in life. I, I understand that. I mean, with me, I, I am a singer. Do you sing? If only in the shower and only when the doors are shut, so no one can hear me. But whatever, whatever gifts I have, singing ain't one of them. Fair enough. How about this one then? Number three. What's your favorite Christmas t- tradition for your family? Um, I think uh, several, but one is just hanging up. Um, ornaments on the christmas tree because that brings back a lot of memories kids real kids really like that um and also for uh for me um because we have ornaments that my mom gave me when i when i was young Uh, so i think hanging up those ornaments is a little bit of a journey down memory lane and a lot of those uh, memories are, are nice ones happy ones do you have any um do you you continue to add ornaments to the tree every year yeah, but we have most most of them are just a matter of getting them out of storage and uh, and then uh, doing the ones that, that we've had. Uh, so we might add, but uh, but I think we've kind of maxed out on that. And so now it's more uh, hanging things both to make the tree look nice, but again, also to try and um, capture certain certain happy memories. So how about this? Or does your family, when do you put up the tree or when is it allowable to put up the tree? Well, in this, this year, we put it up right after Thanksgiving, uh, the weekend after Thanksgiving, our uh, youngest son was home from college. Our daughter uh, is uh, living with us uh, for a couple of years. She works in the National Institutes of Health and she's in the process of applying for graduate school. And um, then we have a, another son who's, who's, who's on the, uh, on the West, West coast. So two of them were, we're here, so we figured, well, let's do it when at least we've got two of them here. Hmm. It's always good to have the kids around. Yeah. Setting up- oh, yeah, sure. Different pieces. All right, here we go. Number four, what's your favorite Christmas food that you really don't get too many other times in the year? Oh, I, you know, Christmas cookies, actually. <laughs> That's <laughs> um, And uh, with, uh, um, yeah, I'd say Christmas cookies are pretty, pretty, pretty high up there because we, dec- we get to decorate them too oh you actually make them like you you your family does yeah that. yeah and then and then we we uh are able to to decorate them with you know uh different different colors and uh so that's a lot of fun actually it's the, the cookies are good but uh making them is is fun as well it's just fun being with the family i think yeah no, I'm dealing with the family. All right, here we go. Number five. How about this one? Since you did talk a little bit about memories, what's your favorite Christmas memory that you can share? Uh, you know, I would say, um, actually, the the non Christian answer is when I was a young kid watching the Dallas Cowboys during Christmas Day win a playoff game, um, because I was a huge Dallas Cowboy fan. And it was actually a bonding experience, certainly for me and my brother, uh, but also for uh, for my parents when 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 they kind of got got into it too. So that's the non Christian answer. I think it was the Cowboys and Vikings, and they played on a Christmas Day. Um, apart from that, favorite uh, Christmas uh, memory, you know, uh, 
there there are moments that I have memories that I have when my parents would give us uh, gifts and I would run and jump in their arms. Um, mm. And I knew that that brought them a lot of joy um, because uh, because I had joy and I was and I was happy. And so that memory of me running and jumping and them uh, grabbing me, you know, I was eight, nine at the time. So it wasn't like I was an adult, um, in which case that wouldn't have worked so well, but, uh, that's, that's a nice memory. I think those are the memories that we hold on the, the of the Christmases past where those family members are no longer around. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? What's, what's your favorite Christmas memory? Oh my goodness. Well, my father died when I was a little boy. And so I have an early memory of being at the house. I think it was the Christmas before he passed. Mm. And the whole his brothers and sisters would sit around. And this is when back in the 70s, when every brother bought for each other and their kids, which I don't know how they afforded to ever do that just because it's so expensive. But every kid got presents. And I just remember being with my parents and watching them hug and and just loving that, you know, and and uh, he died not too long after that. But uh, I'm getting choked up. Now you're asking me those questions and I'm getting all emotional. <laughs> But, but I think that's it. I saw a meme the other day on online where it had the family sitting around on the Thanksgiving table, but it had kind of the ghosts of family members past standing there, that kind of cloud of witnesses. And and it just reminded me that's that's really what it's about. It's the quality of the relationships that we have. And, and, and that's what I love about the gospel. It really does bring that out and talks about how to love God and love people. Really, it's yeah. coming down to that. Which leads me to my next question, as you're within the public arena, but yet you are an evangelical Christian, and you mentioned the non-Christian version and the Christian version, so I'm curious on when did you, what's your story of faith? How did you come to faith in Christ? Yeah, it, uh, you know, I didn't grow up in a, in a Christian household. I don't have a memory of going to church um, as, as a kid. Um, I I, my mom brought us but I was young and I just don't have any, any real memories of, of that. I started my journey of faith. I think it was between my junior and senior year in, in, uh, in high school. And I started it really coincident um, with my closest friend, a fellow named Brad Shannon. Um, Brad recently passed away mm -hmm. for the first 25 years of my life. He, he was the person that I, uh, that I was closest to out, outside of family. And, um, and I remember, um, asking, um, a lot of questions. My sister is five years older than I am, had, uh, come back for that summer. She was actually interning at a church. And for reasons that are just unknown to me, um, these questions started to come. If there was a deep longing for faith to try and meet some need i wasn't aware of it that could have been a factor but at least uh consciously speaking that wasn't a driving force um and so brad and i would would talk about it and then i got a notepad from my dad's notepad and i remember jotting down all of these questions and asking my sister who uh who was extremely important in that in that journey very intelligent um and thoughtful and um but didn't pretend to answer questions that that she couldn't answer so that started the 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 journey uh and it was for me uh, a long journey i would say heavily intellectual uh for the early part um not easy i remember telling telling uh patty that i felt like uh faith was sort of like sand in the gears for me it just didn't come very easily and um, I still remember actually at a relatively early stage in that journey, um, when I would read the words of Paul, I, I was slightly intimidated because I thought this was a person who was reaching the limits of language in terms of what he was expressing, mm -hmm. in terms of his love for Christ and, and, and God and how animating it was to his life. And I thought that's an impossible standard to meet. How do you fall in love with a figure that you don't see, that you just mm -hmm. read about? And even the Gospels, in many cases, aren't beautiful poetry. It's just sort of straightforward history. And so part of it was like, how, how do you even enter into this? Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, but there were key people along the journey for me. When I went to University of Washington, I was at University Presbyterian Church and, and met a pastor who was uh, 
head of student ministry at the time, Steve Hayner. Steve later became president of InterVarsity and Columbia Theological Seminary. And Steve was an important early figure in my life, really a model for me, person that I looked to and thought there's an individual of integrity uh, who, 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 modeled, um, who modeled faith. I developed a trust with Steve. Uh, so even though when I, I didn't know him that well, I, I went to him, I, I remember when I was in college with uh, some, uh, some issues that I was really struggling with and it never shared with anybody else. And, um, but I had enough trust in Steve that I felt like I could go to him. Um, and that, that was, that was an important moment and a bonding moment for me. Steve was a significant figure really throughout the rest of my life. He, he passed away in 20, 2015, um, mm -hmm. tragically. Um, and, uh, then I came to Washington, DC. I came through, through an internship when I was a senior at, at, at university of Washington. And then, uh, for me, the cross became Central, and that sounds a bit obvious if you're a person of the Christian faith, but I'll explain what I mean by it. Um, because I had a lot of these questions, uh, which I continue to have to, 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 to this day and discuss them with theologians and pastors and others, but they were often a, at least a quasi-referendum on God's character. And I came to believe in the truth of the of the crucifixion and the resurrection i actually did a college paper on that topic at, at university of washington which is not a christian school on the case for and against the resurrection so I did a lot of research into that question and i came to believe that it actually happened it was the central event in human history and what happened is um there was some dawning realization uh not only of of the centrality of the cross but that that was emblematic of God's character toward us for all time, that that was, in a sense, the climactic statement of God's love for us and devotion to us. And so whatever the answer to those questions were, they were consistent with God's character that was demonstrated on the cross. That didn't answer the questions of theodicy uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of other, other, other questions. Um, but it did insulate, you know, God's character uh, it went with these with these questions. So that was that was an important moment. And then I just been hugely blessed um, and and um, helped by, you know, countless individuals along the journey um, of in all sorts of ways who've leaned into my life, the life of my family, and modeled to me what it means to be Christian of of, of uh, Christians of integrity. I mean, being a Christian in, is difficult no matter where it is, but being in the public arena, especially the political arena, it can be very confusing for people very quickly. And yet that's where you've been. I mean, you've served for three presidential administrations, uh, speechwriter, advisor, campaigns. I mean, just reading your bio, it's politics has been a lot of your life. And of course, you've become much more of a writer in the last few years in that you've been, I mean, you've always been a writer, but being more critical of administrations, especially when it comes to how evangelicals have received different administrations um, for a variety of different things that we've seen going on. And I know you and I have communicated back and forth about the nihilism that we see within evangelicalism today. I mean, where do you really see that being worked out within the, the church today? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's playing itself out uh, in all sorts of ways, and um, and it's just not my observation from afar. I've um, been really privileged to get to know a lot of pastors throughout my life, and you know, people that I've known for most of my life, uh, and others that I've met, you know, at various various points. And I actually did an essay a couple of years ago in the Atlantic on sort of the fracturing of the evangelical church. And it was quite striking to me. Was a, I, I don't know, it's probably 75%, 70% was reporting. And it was based on conversations with pastors, primarily, but also theologians. And to hear from them about the divisions within the, the church um, that, that, that was happening um, was pretty sobering. It wasn't a shock to me. I mean, I went in with that thesis. But I think what what did stand out to me is that nobody that I reached out to challenged the thesis of the growing divisions and acrimony within the church. And a number of people 
we're basically saying you don't know the half of um, of it. So, um, so I think the church is in a in a moment of 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 deep deep division. I I don't know whether nihilism uh, is exactly the problem, or at, let me put it this way: I don't know a lot of Christians who would characterize themselves as nihilists. That is mm-hmm. the belief that truth doesn't exist um, and that life is sort of meaningless. And and uh, you know you can make up your own your your own narratives to fit whatever you want. I actually think that in many cases that's happening, um, but I think what's what what is what is going on is um, not nihilism per se, um, and not not being embraced. Because if you, if I asked or I had conversations, which I have with with Christians who are embracing what I think are quasi nihilistic movements or conspiracy theories or um untruths they wouldn't say yeah it's not true but uh but but i'm doing it anyway because life has no meaning and there's no objective truth they just have a different um sources of authority that they're that they're relying on and so they would come back at me and say no 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 you're you're wrong um you know uh, the covid vaccines are dangerous and uh hydro- hydroxychloroquine does cure it or or whatever or the election was stolen or i mean you can you can pick pick your narratives so i i think what's happening is that they're embracing narratives that are false but in many cases the people who are embracing them don't know that they're that they're false and we live in an age of fractured information sources so you can basically find any uh, website or 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 any organization to validate what you what you already already believe. In some respects, I suppose um, Travis is a little bit like hermeneutics in scripture. Uh, you know, it's Shakespeare famously wrote *The Merchant of Venice*. One of his characters said that uh, the devil can quote scripture for his own purposes, and I think that's right. You can justify almost anything that you want by selecting verses in certain parts of the bible certain moments and say um you know this this is validated because x verse um and so to me in the in the in the area of hermeneutics it's not simply or even primarily knowing biblical verses it's having the wisdom and discernment to know what verses apply in what context? What about the ethos under, you know, under uh, underneath it? How do you how do you deal with people? Um, how do you deal with your enemies? Mm-hmm. Do you look to First Samuel or Deuteronomy or Joshua or do you look to the Sermon on the Mount? Um, when is compassion called for? When is anger called for? What kinds of anger do you know do 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 we look for? So. The older I've gotten, the, the less confident I am in 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 people who simply are able to quote the Bible, and the more um, I've come to appreciate people who have the wisdom and discernment to try and figure out how it all applies. You have made an observation that I think, as you said, you've talked to these different pastors that have noted the the growing divisions that are there. And recently, and I'm not sure if you've seen the book that came out in October called The Great Dechurching where they were examining what's gone on and their statistics were jolting to say the least, not to those who are in the arena, but to those who are kind of coming to this. When you hear the numbers, 41 million people have disappeared from church over the last 25 years. Right. And there's, they cite a variety of different reasons. They cross the political spectrum. And, but part of that is a growing percentage are frustrated with the, the political rhetoric and no longer can you, avoid the political discussion in church. There's no just, we're going to avoid it and move on. Um, There is in the churches, the pastors are finding themselves pastoring churches where there is a massive division. And, and honestly, they're feeling a bit threatened. Not only are they fearful of their own jobs and taking care of their family, but they know whatever stance that they will take, they will immediately be called out online or that group will leave their church and go to a affirmation of whatever political persuasion you want how do we help our people to really stay true to the word of god the message of jesus but also to see the means that are being employed in our current political moment how do we help them to see the truth of christ in the midst of that and to remain faithful even if it means 
suffering politically and quite possibly in their own economic situation? Yeah, no, it's a really, really good question. It's a very pressing question because I've, I've had conversations w- with pastors on on exactly that issue. Um, and um, and you're quite right. I mean, churches are dividing, families are dividing in this in this in this political um, moment. Um, <clears throat> I I think in my own analysis, that's a product largely of the of the Trump era. Uh, but these divisions and polarization predated. Donald Donald Trump. Yeah. I think it's been certainly accelerated since then. <clears throat> and I would, I'd, I'd even add to, to make the situation somewhat more complicated is that you can have people uh, break in churches um, not only because a pastor uh, uh, directly uh, mentions politics or political figures. I mean, that's sure to create... Um, divisions within a church but there's even sort of subtext going on and so if 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 a pastor is talking about uh welcoming the, the stranger and the sojourner and there are people who are very angry about immigration or illegal immigration then they may say look you're trying to send a political message through 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 these verses or through through this um exegesis on on scripture so pastors actually try and avoid passages that aren't meant to send a political message but be could be could be could be heard heard that uh that way look i you know i'm troubled like a lot of people that um that the means and the method that a lot of christians or a lot of people who purport to be christian are employing in politics um, and um, and in our our cultural and, and civic civic life, uh, you know, on this that de-churching issue uh, that you mentioned and in, in, in the book that came out recently, there are a, a lot of different reasons on why young people are, are leaving the church. Uh, but my own view is that one large reason is that a lot of young people see Christians, particularly evangelical Christians, white evangelicals who have rallied uh, around and behind Donald Trump and the MAGA movement. And um, he, he is a person, um, I, I think, uh, obviously I could be wrong about this and I'm happy to, to talk to people about it, talk to you about it. But I think that Donald Trump is a person who, who is um, uh, a man of, of, of moral depravity in a lot of ways, a man of borderless corruptions and a grave threat uh, to the country and uh and to a lot of ideals that that christians sit for and it's pretty simple really i mean you have a lot of um people uh who uh like al moeller is is one example there are a lot of others who in the 1990s when bill clinton was president uh and the monica Lewinsky scandal happened character was primus inter paris it was first among equals and resolutions were passed by the southern baptist convention and people spoke out people of the Christian faith, and said that if you have corrupt character, um, then you're not fit to to be a political leader. And every other day, it seemed like they took a figurative two by four upside the head of Bill Clinton. So it doesn't really matter how the country's doing, whether the economy's doing well. You can't compartmentalize like that. Presidents set a moral tone for the country. They're examples to our children, to the rest of the country. And uh, we need people of, of of high character to be our leaders. So, you know, fast forward now to, to the time in which Donald Trump is president. In many ways, Donald Trump makes Bill Clinton look like a Boy Scout. And those same beliefs, those same convictions have not only been jettisoned, but the white evangelical movement is in many respects the, the great defender uh, of, of, of Donald, uh, Donald Trump. And there are a lot of significant figures in the evangelical movement, white evangelical movement, who defend him, um, you know, day after day after day. So if if you're an unbeliever, particularly young people, and you're seeing this, you say, this is a moral freak show. I mean, who, who are these guys trying to kid? This was just a power play. It's like morality matters when the other side uh, messes up. But when our side messes up, our our team screws up. Um, we just apply a different, different standard. So that's one thing. And the other is, 
Eugene Peterson um, had a, had a phrase um, which he called the Jesus way. There's the Jesus truth and the Jesus way. And and Peterson said you can't pursue the Jesus truth without pursuing the Jesus way. And what he meant by that is a sort of ethic, a way of dealing with people uh, that should define Christians in public life and in life in in general. And the dehumanization of of uh, of the opposition um, is just not something that is acceptable or allowable or something that is, is, is consistent with the ethic of, of Jesus or the, or the life of Jesus. And if the Jesus way is at odds with the Jesus truth, and if evangelical Christians are um, defined by resentment, anger, fear, um, mm -hmm. zealotry, um, and, uh, and those kind of things, then, um, you know, that's, that's going to create a problem. And we're seeing that problem play itself out. How do you respond to those? Uh, I remember when in 2016, when Trump was running and I remember people saying, well, what's, what are my choices? This is all I have. If I, and I, I know you've heard this argument back and forth, it's been played out ad nauseum in so many different households and conversations online. And they said, well, I know what I'm going to get with Clinton. I don't know what I'm going to get with Donald Trump. And then, of course, he gets into office and he does play to the base really well. He gives them many what they have wanted. And some might say, well, look, now we have um, abortion. His is the Roe v. Wade is being reversed. So the end is justified the means. How do we help people to see or respond to that in, in the midst of all that? Yeah, I'd say I'd say several things about it. Uh, the first thing I would say is that um, I said many times during the 2016 election that I understood the argument that Christians made when they said that they were going to um, vote for Trump rather than Hillary Clinton. Um, I didn't agree with them. I didn't vote for either one. But I understood the 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 argument and the and the logic, even the moral logic. They were basically saying Trump has flawed character. Um, but on the other hand, we think his policies are going to advance moral good. And, and do more um, to advance the ideals that we care about. And so we have to weigh them and different people will come out on uh, on how those scales fall. So I think that that, uh, that, that was a reasonable way to look at it. Um, again, I, I think it was a mistake um, in, in, um, in choosing Trump, but, um, but that was a frame that, that uh, I think could be, could be at least argued. Um, I think it's just different now. I think we've had four years of Donald Trump, and I think several things have happened. One is that um, his the, the 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 malicious and malevolent nature of his character is pretty obvious. You know, it's, it's too, too long a list to go over, but he's been indicted four times, ninety-one counts, impeached twice, found liable of, of sexual uh, assault, essentially rape, um, and sexual um, harassment hush money payments to uh, uh, to a porn star effort to try and overthrow the election, um, instigated uh, a violent attack on, on the Capitol, um, peddling and uh, lie after lie after lie, conspiracy theories. Um, and so this is a man who's, whose character is pretty clear by now. So you no longer have, I think, the excuse or the rationalization of, well, maybe he'll be fine. Maybe he'll be contained and controlled. That was that was really the argument. So that's uh, that's one one point I would make. Second point I would make is that what's really troubled me most about Christians in the political arena isn't that they um, would defend Donald Trump on this or that set of policies, uh, whether it's the Supreme Court nominees, nominees, um, and and those were the ones in which for a lot of conservative Christians. Um, he, he he was a success, and I think he was. That's one of the areas uh, where I think he did advance conservative cause. That's fine. People can can make that argument. They can make the argument. That they're glad that he moved the the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But what's missing, far 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 too often, is in uh, while acknowledging the successes that they think he had to also speak out about the moral failures and the moral flaws and the moral transgressions, to say, look, I think the Supreme Court um, appointments were good, but I also think that being found guilty uh, of sexual assault 
and sexual harassment and paying porn stars uh, hush money because you're hiding an affair with your third wife while she's giving birth, four indictments on 91 counts, and the cruelty and the crudity of his, of his language and the lies. That needs to be called out by, by people of faith too. You can do both things. Hmm. And what happened is that over time, you could just see it that the the Christians who would have said in 2016, yeah, you know, he's a he's a flawed character and I'm an easy with him, but I I'm going to reluctantly vote for him. That has given way. They've made their accommodation. It's a really fascinating psychological insight, right? Which is when you do accommodation after accommodation after accommodation, um, you end up in a very different way. I'm I'm really confident that. A lot of the people that I've had conversations with in 2016, people of Christian faith, some people I went to church with, others that I've, I've uh, been involved in Christian activities. If I had said in October of 2016, here's a list of the things by the time we get to 2023 that Donald Trump will have said and done. And I had, had run through that list and told them, I'm very, very confident they... One is that they would have rolled their eyes and said, oh, this is Trump derangement syndrome. You, you, you're, you, you just hate Trump and there's no way he would have done these things. But if he would do those things that you're stipulating, of course I would break with him. How can I stand with a man that would do those kinds of things? But now they do stand with him. And in fact, they're they're more enthusiastic, not less enthusiastic than they were. And they have changed not him. And they've imbibed his ethics and his approach. And there's a kind of psychic satisfaction, honestly, that a lot of Christians, way too many Christians or people who claim to be Christians take in seeing the ferocity and the crudity and the cruelty of Donald Trump, because there's so much anger, so much frustration, so many pent up feelings that we've been dishonored and disrespected by the elite culture. And he hates the same people that we do. And he has the same enemies that we do, and he's taken it to them. And I've had conversations in 2016. I had one recently, uh, email exchange with someone in the right-wing uh, ecosystem, and they both basically said the same thing. This most recent conversation, which was just a few weeks ago, the person said, uh, of course, Donald Trump isn't good and decent, but good and decent doesn't work anymore. We have to win. And a conversation I had with a person from a church that I was attending in 2016 said almost the identical thing. Said in an email exchange I had with him, they said, everything you say about Donald Trump is true. But what did the establishment guys get, get, give us? The establishment guys being McCain, Romney, mm -hmm. uh, Bush, and others. Got us Barack Hussein Obama. Got to get the middle name in there. And so maybe what we have to do is we need a guy who's going to bring a gun to a cultural knife fight. And if he's going to use some means and some methods that are that that make us uncomfortable, we wouldn't use. That's the price that it takes to win. Now, when Christians go there, they're giving up almost everything about their their ethics. Third thing I would say is that the years of Donald Trump are not the years of milk and honey that that his supporters like to portray i mean if you go through the objective cri um, criteria for the country the metrics of the country in terms of how it's doing economically uh in terms of crime in terms of abortion and other things we are not in a decidedly worse place now under joe biden than we were under donald trump in fact economically you can certainly make the case that biden's economic record or at least the economy under biden has been better but let's take Roe v. Wade. That's a really, really, really good, good issue. And that would be one in which Christians would say, yeah, we got rid of Roe v. Wade. And we did. And I thought it was a terrible Supreme Court decision. But too often, their Christians speak as if getting rid of Roe v. Wade means getting rid of abortions. If you look at the number of abortions in America, the high water mark, depending on whether you're doing absolute numbers or rate and ratio, was late 80s, early 90s. In the early 90s, there were about 1.6, 1.7 million abortions. They went down every year under presidents from the early 90s up until the end of the Obama 
presidency. There were fewer abortions in America at the end of Barack Obama's term than there were before Roe v. Wade. Um, now, I'm not saying cause and effect. Um, I don't think it was because uh, the policies of Obama or Bill Clinton, they went down under George W. Bush too. But the reality is that the number of abortions went down at a greater rate under Democratic presidents than Republican presidents. And as we're seeing now, um, Roe v. Wade is actually a, an opinion that people liked. And so you now have a lot of conservative states, uh, Kansas and others, that are in their state constitution putting the right to, to an abortion. And I believe the number of abortions, only time they've gone up since the, since, uh, the early 90s, was under Donald Trump. So uh, it is not as if the, these achievements under Trump was a great moral uh, moral uh, moral break breakthrough. Um, so you know I'm I'm familiar with those arguments. I hear them. I, I think in many cases they're a rationalization or a justification. People are scrambling because for a lot of different reasons, including um, reasons of of culture and psychology, they've latched on to Trump, and so they have to construct arguments to try and justify that decision because it's pretty obvious that there is a contradiction between people who claim to be followers of Jesus, who are extremely enthusiastic for Donald Trump. And the human mind tries to mitigate that kind of cognitive dissonance. And I, I think, as you've already alluded to, and I've heard the same stats that you alluded to just a moment ago, where you mentioned that under certain Republicans, the abortion rate, well, I mean, you said it was going down, but it's the whole thing with guns, the same kind of idea. When you have a president comes in that's anti-gun, everyone buys guns and the gun rates go up. <laughs> and it's almost as if it's the whole, I wouldn't know, like Juan Paul says, I wouldn't know what sin was until the law said, don't do it. And then I, I awaken within me to want to do it and people react in fear. But as we're going back to this, just for a moment, back to the mission and the pastors that we're interacting with here as they're trying to figure out how to still navigate this. We all have our political opinions. We can't afford, though, just to let it go on the you know, to let it go to the wayside or let our people's opinions just stay where they're at any longer. And especially, as you mentioned, white evangelicalism specifically, having pastored a multi-ethnic church, that was the issue that I was constantly navigating. Right. I was constantly trying to deal with the, the white evangelicals who saw it just through their own isolated lens of what they consider to be biblical truth. They couldn't see the African-Americans through the social justice lens in which many of them had come at it. Right. At. And yet I'm trying to see, show them that there are biblical principles on each side in some way, shape or form, but they've become distorted as they've gone back and forth. How do we help people to, how do we retain our Christian witness or is there a possible way of gaining it back in the midst of this society when many people feel like it's been stolen from them from the get-go. For them, they're like, it doesn't matter what I say. The political narrative that is being portrayed in the media has taken it from me, and I'm the one that has to deal with the collateral damage of what's going on with the people around me. How do yeah. I help my people to see biblical truth when they themselves are more co-opted by the media than they are by the scripture itself? Yeah, that's that is the urgent question that a lot of pastors are 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 uh, are dealing with. I mean, the the way that I've heard it, you probably heard the same same thing. You know, their congregants are watching fifteen or twenty hours a week of cable television, and that's shaping their mind and sensibilities because churches get them for you know, if you're lucky, you get them every Sunday, maybe a Sunday school class, and if you're really committed members, you know, every other week for, 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 for a covenant group or, or whatever the name that's being, being used at, at that, at the time. And so in terms of the catechesis, the shaping of those sensibilities, the world is, is, is shaping it. That, that is the problem. I mean, basically what's happening is, is um, you've got people who are, who, who, are, uh, and this is true on the left and the right, and even to some extent, people in between, um, that their that their attitudes, their dispositions, um, are um, are inflamed. What I've learned, it's more vivid now than in the past. I've, I've always known that this that the situation existed, but it's it's more pronounced uh, and deeper than 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 I realize. And that is the degree, uh, honestly, Travis, that I that I think that uh, faith 
is a secondary for a lot of people who believe in their life that it's primary. That is, if you spoke to a person who's who's a genuine Christian, they would tell you that being faithful to Jesus and walking with integrity in the Christian faith is the most important thing in terms of mind and soul and spirit. Uh, so if you gave them sodium pentothal and said, what's most important to you? They would say their faith. But I think in practice, what happens is that we're all shaped by countless things in our lives, our family of origin, the friends we know, the institutions we attended, the schools that we went to, the communities that we're a part of now, what we watch, the people who affirm us, the people who 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 who, uh, who irritate us. Um, there are cultural factors, there are psychological factors, there are life experiences, and those shape who we are. And what we do is we then come and we mold the faith to fit who we are and what those pre-existing views are. We think what we're doing is we're being faithful to the Bible. In fact, what we're doing is we're being faithful to some ideology, some cultural shaping event. And then, as we were talking about earlier, you take verses and, 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 and scripture and ratify what you already believe. Uh, so it's kind of like a jet fuel to these already sort of intense and deeply held 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 beliefs. So how do you how, if that's the case, you know, how do you undo that? I mean, that's that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question in for churches and for pastors, right? Which is ultimately how do you shape, you know, to use a Jonathan Edwards phrase, the, the affections of the heart? Mm -hmm. How do you fall more in love with Jesus? How do you let him shape the kind of person you are, the prism through which you see the world rather than the, than the other way around? Um, and, and you know, different pastors will have different ways of doing it, depending on what their skill sets um, are. Um, and, but ultimately, I think what you have to do is you have to get people to fall more in love with Jesus. You've got to get people to model grace. You have to probably reset what the purpose of dialogue and conversation is, which is not victory, but truth. There's there's a story that C.S. Lewis and Owen Barfield had, which which um, I find admirable and and impressive. Um, Lewis and Barfield um, were part of the Inklings, the great literary group in the middle part of the of the 20th century in England. C.S. Lewis was the key figure there, but so was J.R.R. Tolkien and Charles Williams and others. And, and Owen Barfield was part of that as a poet and philosopher. And um, Lewis and Barfield were were uh, were close. Um, I think the first book that Lewis ever dedicated was to Owen Barfield. And, and I think what Lewis said is that, that Barfield was his first and greatest teacher. But Lewis and, and, and Owen Barfield had deep disagreements on pretty esoteric matters of faith. So they would debate. And in Surprise by Joy, Lewis's autobiography, um, he talks about these conversations and debates with, with Owen Barfield. And he said, uh, Barfield and I would go at it hammer and tong late into the night. You could begin to, to feel and absorb the power of the other person's uh, blows and, and and arguments, and almost unconsciously, you would begin to absorb what they what they were. Um, what was interesting to me, and and what I think we need to recapture as as people of faith, is that Barfield and Lewis treasured their relationship um, in large part, not totally, but in large part because they saw things differently and they felt like that they were better because they had each other in their, in their lives. And Barfield would later say that Lewis and I never uh, debated for victory. We debated for truth. And that's an entirely different way to approach a conversation, whether it's a conversation about theology or hermeneutics or politics or anything else, which is when we engage with each other, how can we help each other to move somewhat closer to the truth and reality of things. None of us sees anything like the full measure of truth. 
we all have our blind spots. We're all products of, 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 of those factors we talked about earlier. So the question is how, how do, how do we do it? So if the church could, could, could model that, you know, it would, um, it would, it would help the idea of trying to teach what human anthropology is, which is everybody is created in the image of God and therefore dehumanization is not, is not, um, is not allowable. Uh, what it means to be instruments of grace and reconciliation and to heal a broken world. Um, and that can happen through the pulpit. It can happen through th Sunday school classes, but it also happens just in individual lives. When you get to know people, their journey, their struggles, their hopes, their disappointments, the wounds that they've had over their life. And when you're able to connect with people on that level, that in my experience opens up all sorts of other conversations. Um, what doesn't work in theology or politics uh, as a general matter is if I come in and say, you know, uh, Travis, your 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 or human hermeneutics are wrong, and here are the eight reasons why. And I just try and overwhelm you, you know, mow you over with with arguments. What's going to happen is this, to you is the same thing that would happen to me if you did that to me, which is you get defensive, uh, you get angry, you'd want to lash out. Uh, certain element of pride comes in. This person is 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 trying to bully me. Um, I, I just have these beliefs, so back off, you know. So just trying to overwhelm people with arguments and scolding them doesn't always work. Now, that doesn't mean that at certain key moments in the life of a church or a life of a nation that you don't have people speak hard truths or prophetic truths, right? There's, there's, there's obviously a whole history of the importance of the prophet, or you can look through figures like Martin Luther King Jr., who both championed love but also spoke some very hard truths uh, in, uh, for, for Christians uh, who, who were supporting segregation. So, um, I, you know, I think that that's what has to, has to happen. And just one other thing I'll say about this is, you know, pastors also have to determine um, at what point do they feel like they need to speak out, not necessarily from the pulpit, but maybe in their own name, um, at a key moral moment in the life of a church or life of a, of a country. For example, I've asked a lot of pastors and I'm not necessarily recommending that they, that they speak out now, you know, in terms of politics, because I know it can divide a church. And I know that if, if it's perceived that you're saying something negative or positive for Donald Trump on one Sunday, then the next Sunday, when you talk about, or, or give a sermon on Philippians two, the congregation may, congregation may tune you out. Having said that, I've asked pastors who don't want to speak out at this moment, are you glad that there were Christian pastors and ministers who spoke out during the segregation and slavery? And almost to a person, they say, yes. It would be a shame to look back and say, at this moment when Blacks were being dehumanized, enslaved, segregate, segregated, looked down upon because of the color of their skin, we had nothing to say. We were too afraid about dividing our congregation that we we decided we were going to to um, not name it. And then on the really on the on the further extreme, you know, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right? The German Confessional Church. The vast majority of German Christians in Nazi Germany sided with the Nazi regime. Bonhoeffer, as, as you know, said no, and there were small group that that spoke out he ended up losing his life i'm not saying that we're at a bonhoeffer moment and that, that the country is near the nazi regime i'm just saying that there's a spectrum here and my impulse throughout my entire life is pastors should stay out of politics first thing that i ever had published in my life was trying to warn christians from conflating politics and a political agenda with with christianity so that's very much my 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 disp disposition, but I do think that we as followers of Christ, because we feel like we have something to say morally and in the public square at key moments, need to be alert and ask ourselves what's required of us as followers of Jesus, as, as truth tellers, um, as 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 people who stand for a certain kind of uh, you know moral moral order. Um, Individual pastors will obviously have to answer that 
um, depending on their facts and circumstances and and what their conscience tells them. This is the area in which we find ourselves, as you've already alluded to, and these aren't easy, easily understandable issues. As you said, we have so many different attachments. We have so many different experiences that shape us and how we go about it. Not, not to mention the the power plays, the argumentation, the, the all of these different things are, are are at work within our society today. And as you've already alluded to, it didn't just begin with Trump. This has gone on, as, and it, even in alluding to the great dechurching, it's been 25 years that this has been going on. Right. Now, he might have helped further it or accelerate it, and same, the same with COVID. But one of the things that you have mentioned is, in, and I, I remember this in the address that you gave at Wheaton, you said, much of what has been done by evangelical Christians is damaging our civic fabric and under, undermining the public witness of Christianity. Can you elaborate on that for us? Because I don't think many Christians think that's what they're doing. They think that they're saving the civic fabric in which we're finding ourselves. And you're saying, no, 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 it's the opposite. Yeah, and no, I think that's right. Um, th there are two elements to that. There's the civic fabric, and then there is, for those of us who are Christian, the, the witness, the public witness of Christianity. Um, so let, let me take both of them. The civic fabric um, is, I think, pretty self-evident. Uh, I think that Donald Trump and his movement, um, because of the ethos and the ethic that they embody, have done tremendous damage to our civic fabric. Um, and, and I think this full-out, all-out assault on truth, this term people use, which is gaslighting, is tremendously disorienting and tremendously troubling. And I think that the divisions and the acrimony and the anger um, not solely because of Donald Trump. Again, I want to underscore what you said and what I said earlier, which is a lot of these trends and currents were in motion before he got there. But I think there's no question that he's accelerated them. And so the idea that Donald Trump is a solution or is a healing force for our civic fabric uh, or can bring a fractured country together uh, or he can restore respect for truth and decency and honor and integrity, I think that that's, that's just on his face absurd. It doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of people that believe it, um, but I think that they've deluded themselves. I think some of them are cynical. I think some people do it because of a lot of different reasons, um, but I take it that there are a lot of people who genuinely believe it, but the passion that you hold to, to to a certain belief doesn't tell you whether that belief is true or not. You can you can passionately believe a lot of things that are wrong and de and destructive. So the idea that that the MAGA movement or that Donald Trump or what the what the Republican Party represents today, and I say this as somebody who, as you mentioned, has worked in three Republican administrations, I'm senior advisor of George W. Bush, worked in the Reagan administration work with George W. Bush and his administration. So I've been a lifelong Republican. Um, so I had to break with a party that was not only one that I identified with, but that my career had been centered centered on. Um, but I think that that party today and the way it's defined and, and the movement that defines it is doing huge damage to our civic uh, fabric and the ethic of this country. Then there's the issue of the public witness. And I uh, was on the West Coast a couple of years ago and visiting a pastor who was very influential in my own journey of, of faith when I was younger. Uh, his name is Carl Kopic. Um, and we were having breakfast uh, and I was asking uh, Carl, uh, who's no left wing radical by by any means, what was happening to, in terms of his observation about the political moment and its effect on the Christian witness, particularly young people. And he said, Pete, it's a generational catastrophe that a lot of young people are seeing what's unfolding. They're seeing the white evangelical movement align itself to Donald Trump and his movement. And they think it's a joke. They, they as I said earlier, um, these are my words, not Carl's, but that this is a kind of moral, moral freak show that there is hypocrisy, that there's double standards, that um, the will to power 
the ends justify the means um, is is what's uh, you know what's what's needed. So if you're a person um, of who's not a follower of Jesus, or you are and you're young and you're searching around, it matters a lot what the community is that you're being asked to become a part of. And I think for a lot of young people and a lot of people who aren't that young, they're deeply disenchanted and discouraged by what they're saying. And they're saying, you know what? This this argument about faith and the fruit of the spirit that's supposed to characterize followers of Jesus, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, that's just for Sunday. You guys walk out of the church, you walk out of those doors, you do whatever the hell you want and you rationalize it. And you not only rationalize it, you justify it with the scriptures. You actually think that your Lord and your faith is, is commanding you, causing you to be, be these kind of instruments of division and cruelty and crudity, the assault on truth, uh, and all of the rest. And when people see that, it doesn't matter whether N.T. Wright makes a really strong case on page 538 of Resurrection of the Son of God. Because most people are going to, a large factor in whether they're going to become people of faith or join a community of faith is are these people that I can be around whom I respect, that I feel loved by, understood by, and that embody and exemplify a kind of integrity in their life that I want to be a part of. And if that's not what's happening, and they feel like, man, I don't want to be a part of that group, uh, then the chances of, of bringing them into the church or into the faith is just a lot, lot harder so the irony of this, I think it's a tragic irony, is a lot of people who, as I said earlier, would absolutely say with conviction that what matters most is their faith and the evangelization of their faith, to go out and make believers you know, of all nations, that by their politics, that they are actually undermining the very thing that they say they, that, that, that they cherish the most. And they're not aware of it. And in many cases, if that's pointed out to them, um, the the response is 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 to lash out and and to get defensive, um, and um, so that I, it's it's just you know for me the most personally painful part of this what's what's happening these days is the fact that the Christian witness is being you know terribly damaged in America. I'm not in disagreement at all, even as I've, as you alluded to the Great Commission, uh, we did a deep dive study. We had Scott Sundquist on, who's the president of Gordon Conwell, and he wrote a book called The Shape of Christian History, as well as uh, a man named Alan Ye. Both of them are missiologists by training and how the mission of God has been accomplished in any given situation with all the different obstacles that were there. And of course, politics plays a part, especially over history, no matter what culture you find yourself, what do Christians do? And tragically, we haven't done well when we're in the majority. It shouldn't be that way, but it's been true. And one of the things that he alluded to was that the Great Commission, while we all adhere to it, wasn't called the Great Commission until 1664 by a guy named Justinian von Veltz. And it really wasn't until the latter part of the 1800s or the 1700s until William Carey, who was the father of the modern missions movement, advocated it was for all people. Up until that time, they thought it was for uh, really the apostles and uh, there was this, the, the Reformation comes and there's a restoration to that. But even after the Reformation, that's 250 years after the Reformation. But he said, but it's interesting enough that the Great Commandment is always called the Great Commandment. And that is something that has permeated. And unfortunately, we've really lost that love. We've tapped into more of the acceptance of a propositional truth rather than, as you talked about when you alluded to Eugene Peterson, the way of Jesus. Not only do you have the message, but the, the methodologies that are employed. I mean, even when Jesus tells Peter, put away your sword. Those right. who live by the sword will die by the sword. And not, not that he's advocating pacifism and everything. No, we're not talking about that. But we're saying is the means that we employ actually communicates a message. And it is, I think, damaging the Christian witness, not only here in America, but globally. 
as what we've done is being exported around the world for good or for bad it is and it and it it's up to us uh, in some respect to the the world in which we live to help recover that christian christian witness in the spheres in which we find ourselves as we are trying to navigate this let's fast forward now past the election whether or not he's even considered to be a part of it or not and a large part of how we will be, what our playbook will be, will depend on how it plays out. But we do know that no matter what, there's going to be more fractured relationships and there's going to be probably even more increasing division. How do we then, as you, you've mentioned some of it, to listen to people, to have conversations, to delve down deep, as you cited the Inklings, which I love, by the way. And we've had Jerry Root and Mark Knoll talk about on those. Mark was just on talking about C.S. Lewis reception in America. We love Lewis. Love, I got him right here, by the way. That's Lewis right there. <laughs> but how do we help then help our churches heal as we go about this? And I know you're not coming out as a pastor, but you're coming out as a person who is deeply embedded in the political world. And yet, as a Christian, you see the way of Jesus being played out, even in yourself. And you had to, to live that where you are, which is a challenge in itself. Right. How do we help then take that same type of way of jesus let's say that you're trying to to live out where you are embody and act how do we get our people to do that in the midst of the fragment world in which we find ourselves i know it's slightly a different tactic but similar to what you've already said but is there another thing that we can see with that yeah i i do think that um in the end uh what what, what what's going to matter most uh in terms of healing a country would be the healing of individual lives. Um, and that is, is really a matter, I think, of leaning into, to, uh, into people in a, in a community of faith, including leaning into the lives of people that disagree with, with you um, and not viewing them as political projects that you have to change their views on, but getting to know them um, and their stories and their history and their, and and the their the seasons in life that they that they may that they may be in. Um I, I, I could give you a couple of examples maybe that help illustrate it in 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 my in my uh, own uh, own life. Um one was that there was a person who um back in, in the 1990s uh, my wife Cindy and I went went uh, to uh church um and and uh in DC, uh, National Presbyterian Church, and there was a couple uh, there uh, that we got to know, and they, um, you know, liked us very much. We had them over for dinner. We weren't intimate couples by by any means, but we got along well. And this per these this couple was particularly the woman was a, a very ardent Republican, and she was extremely um, happy when I was in the Bush administration first as a deputy speechwriter. Then I was director of something called the Office of Strategic Initiatives. And so I think she was so proud of me and she, and she felt like, you know, we're on the same team. And so there was a, a warmth in that relationship. Um, during the uh, 2016 election and then afterward, uh, when, when Trump was elected, uh, I was pretty vocal, pretty uh, outspoken in my writing. And, and I'm a pretty public writer. I wrote for, write for The Atlantic and The New York Times. And she had read some things that I had written and she was furious with me. And she wrote me a very heated email. Um, and, um, and what I did in response to her, and I, I wouldn't necessarily have done this, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but I, I wrote her back and I said, so-and-so, there's a lot of energy behind this note and you have very strong convictions about this. Why don't we get together for uh, lunch? We'll meet at Jay Gilbert's it's a restaurant here in, here in McLean. And I'm happy to, 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 to buy. And let's, let's just talk. I, I, it's not likely that I'm going to change you, you, your views and you're probably not going to change mine, but it would be a shame if a relationship that, really was based on a common faith were broken over politics. And she wrote back actually a pretty warm note, particularly given the first one that I got. She said, oh, that's really nice. Let's do that. And so we met for lunch 
And I would say 80% of it was me asking questions, not all political questions about her life, her children, things that were unfolding. Um, but then I asked her, what do you listen to, you know, politically? And she told me, she went through the, the talk shows that she listened to, the things that she read. And it was very clear to me what kind of the sources of information were. And, uh, you know, when that ended, we were in a good place. Hmm. We had kind of reconnected and taken an interest in each other's lives. And all of a sudden, those political differences weren't weren't defining. Um, now, as another example is is somebody in 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 the world of um, conservative uh, um, commentary uh, and this is a, a person in the radio talk world. And I had written a piece in the New York Times um, about uh, when Donald Trump had fired James Comey. And I was critical of him for having done that. And this person who I've, I've had a relationship with uh, wrote was, again, very angry. You know, when you sometimes have email exchanges, you're sort of in the second or third round, you can just feel the temperature going up. And I could see that was happening. I think he was starting to make some sort of personal accusations or personal attacks against against me. So I knew this was not going in a in a particularly good good direction. And so I I emailed him back, and I said, "So and so, let me let me tell you why I think we're talking past each other. Uh, let me explain how I think you're viewing things, and let me explain how I am and why we're we're disconnecting." And so I wrote a couple of paragraphs, which was a good, as good faith effort on my part to say, here's how I think you're viewing it. And I gave voice to it, which is you're putting a premium on loyalty. You feel like Donald Trump is, uh, uh, is being waylaid every day by the mainstream media, that his success is critical to the success of a country that you love and that you view yourself I don't think I use this analogy, but this was the upshot of it. It's sort of the offensive line protecting the quarterback. That's mm -hmm. your job. And for you, that kind of loyalty and staying true to, to, to the leader of your party and your movement when he's under attack, that's what you prize. You view me as a sort of traitor to that cause, somebody who knew better and is now uh, attacking it. And I should know better because... Uh, the, the 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 people who are trying to uh, defeat Trump are liberals and progressives, and that would hurt the causes. I said, for, but from my perspective, what I'm putting a premium on is what I perceive to be intellectual integrity, which is if Barack Obama or Bill Clinton or Hillary Clinton did the same thing as Donald Trump did, would I say the same thing in response to it, or would I be dictate? Would I allow? party affiliation or ideology to shape how I interpret events and how I call the balls and the strikes. And I said, you know, for me, I've got to call out Donald Trump because he's an affront to a lot of things I believe in. And the fact that he's a Republican doesn't change that. And so that for me is what's driving it. So we're placing a value on two different, uh, um, or we're, 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 uh, placing importance on two different sets of values. So he wrote me back and he said, you know, I've read your note two or three times and, and it was like a light bulb going on. And he said, you know, it was interesting. He said, um, I'm an advocate. I'm not interested in, in uh, intellectual honesty. I view my role as being an advocate. Hmm. But we connected. And so then fast forward, this was after I think the Parkland shooting in Florida, when his high school students were killed, he was on the uh, radio um, talking about this. And I was writing, uh, I was driving to to, uh, to DC on something called the George Washington Memorial Parkway and was listening to a show. And he, he said something to his listeners uh, because there was a student who was, who was leading an effort at, at gun control. And he said, um, look, uh, go right ahead and disagree with the, the position that this student is arguing for. But he said, but just don't go after the students. 
He said, I have socks that are as old as some of these students. So just don't personally go after them, um, especially in the wake of the trauma yeah. uh, that, it, that it happened. So when I got to the office, I emailed him and I said, I happen to be listening to your show. And I just want to say, I appreciated how you were pushing back against your listeners. It's fine to disagree with them on policy, but don't go after them personally. And he wrote me back and he said, you know, thanks for doing that. And he said, I, I just want you to know that that voice that you heard on the radio wasn't just my voice. It was yours too. Mm -hmm. And that was an example to me because over the years, he and I have become friends. I've found out about his life, some of the losses in his life. We've had discussions about faith and about a lot of other things. And so a friendship developed. And so that kind of human relationship, those kind of human connections are ultimately the things that if I think if we're going to have these sort of conversations, if we're going to depolarize the church, if the divisions and acrimony are going to go down, it's going to take that. And that's what, after all, we're called to be as, you know, as followers of Jesus. I just think we have to to lean into each other's lives, into each other's stories more than we than than we tend to. Um, ask questions uh, rather than 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 mount soap boxes. Even though I've done that a lot in our in our interview, <laughs> it's, it's not it's not always the right thing to do. Um, and um, I I think that that's that's it. I I just don't see, given the human the, the conditions that we're in now, the the moment that exists, and how human beings are are wired. Um, I don't think, you know, you're not going to outshout somebody and you're not going to even out argue them. It doesn't mean that there isn't a place and a role for persuasion. Um, I believe in persuasion. I have my entire life. I'm a writer. Um, but I don't think that just marshalling facts and arguments is um, is is enough. And certainly in, for, for pastors um, in churches. I think it's just essential to try and create a community where the things that knit you together are the the deepest and most profound things in human human life, and and that's not politics. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that. Um, have you heard of Alan Kreider's work, uh, "The Patient Ferment of the Early Church"? Are you familiar with that book? I've heard of the book. I've the author's name doesn't mean much to me. Well, he's he's with Jesus now. He was an Anabaptist, but he had written a book, uh, written this book, and I've seen a lot of people. I'm reading it through it now. But basically, we can now examine through a lot of the church fathers post the book of Acts on how did the early church grow? And there was this kind of idea that was believed and I was taught they had the better arguments. They were more zealous. They the miracles and those pieces, which I'm sure played a part. And of course, all roads led to Rome. But now we can actually see that it came down to four things that really helped grow the church. The first one was patience. The early church was extremely patient in their conversation with one another. Jesus was never in a hurry. They were patient. It wasn't a Roman, a Greco-Roman virtue. They were patient in their dealings, patient in their disagreements. That's one. Two was this French sociological word, and, and you and I both know uh, James Davison Hunter, and he's coming on the show in, in April to discuss his new book. Uh, he is a fascinating guy. And he had said, uh, he talks about habitus, that habit, you know, that French sociological word where every single sphere part of their life was formed by the Christian habit. And even in how they, they, they practice hospitality, they serve the poor. And I, I'm a huge Leslie Newbigin fan. And one of the things that we've talked about a lot on the show is earning the right to be heard yep. requires listening as you've already talked about a lot and that's one of the reasons we picked apollos as our our namesake because apollos he he gets converted after hearing a sermon on jesus being baptized by john the baptist because that's what he preaches and he goes and preaches but priscilla and aquila hear him one place and they're like this guy's awesome but he doesn't know anything so right. they pull him alongside and he listens to them so that he could do it more accurately and so we wanted to be a listening ministry but we've noticed that in our current cultural moment, the church has kind of separated the proclamation from the demonstration aspect of it. Yeah. And we focused on the proclamation thinking that it has to be the argumentation, but the demonstration through the service, the sacrifice, the listening and the suffering 
yep. earns the right to be heard. And that's, of course, a, 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 as you alluded to, even with Tim Keller, not that I'm trying to teach you anything like that, but that's just one of the values that we have. And I think as a church, we have to recover that, that we will endure many tribulations. We are to endure good suffering uh, as a soldier of Christ Jesus in the Middle East. And even Jesus, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And unfortunately, I think what we've talked about and you've alluded to is that we look at the, the we cite the Bible and we think that's good enough, not understanding that the devil himself believes that God is one and the demons tremble. And he quotes the Bible to Jesus for crying out loud. And so we have to make sure that we are interpreting it rightly and living it accordingly and, and making sure we're doing it in the proclamation and in the demonstration. And I think we've we've erred on the proclamation at the cost of the demonstration. Yeah, and that's... that'll preach, right? That'll preach. That's 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 very very good and and very elegantly said. I uh and that's the proclamation demonstration um frame is 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 a really helpful one. Ronnie Stark uh, wrote a yep. book that's, that echoed that where uh, I think the phrase that he used was communal compassion or communal care and he went through the, you know the this is a, sounds like it's very much the same thing, but how did this group, small messianic movement of several dozen people grow into the dominant faith in the entire Western world in a matter of two centuries? And it was not through political power, um, wasn't through cultural power either. It was through the demonstrations of love, of caring for the widow, the orphan, um, the children, the people in need, um, the, uh, really leaning in uh, when people were suffering from medical conditions, treating women as, you know, something better than third class citizens because of the patriarchal misogynistic culture that existed at that at that time. So those are really the things, as you, as you say, the, the demonstration of the Christian witness. That's ultimately what wins wins the hearts of 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 people the the proclamation i mean there's obviously a place for proclamation but faith is not a series of mathematical equations it's and it's not an it, the intellect matters as i said earlier the intellectual journey was important to me but that can only get you so far and in the end reason doesn't get you to faith faith isn't reason it doesn't mean it's irrational but it means it's or transrational and for whatever reason in my reading of those, the scriptures and my understanding of the christian faith that uh, there is something about faith that is you know jesus mm -hmm. saying to thomas blessed are those who haven't seen and believed there's something more blessed about not seeing and believing the act of faith um that gets people uh to to a place and um so you're not going to convince people through, through through mathematical formulations or through just proclamations. You have to do it. You have to speak the language that 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 uh, that others speak, and that and that's the language of love and compassion and empathy. And, and uh, it's uh, interesting you you alluded to that. We we talk about these. Our job is to make to show God is great. And we talk about the Great Commandment, which should express itself in the Great Commission, but it's then lived out in the Great Community. Yeah, it's nice. That John 17, where Jesus said, I pray they may be one as we are one, so the world may know that you sent me. There's something that happens when the barriers are broken. And in the last church I served in, we had a lot of both people on the left and the right. And and it and it, like you said, it's not always down on the argument. Sometimes it was because of the the history, their parent was in that party. That's what they're familiar with. That's their attachment. It didn't always come down to just straight political issues. For them, it was a familial thing. Like my parents were this, or this is what oh, we yeah. noticed and over time. And they may not be familiar with those argumentations. And so what we would do is we would try to preach the truth and and I love how you said this earlier, and this is why I'm a big fan of like George Yancey. I don't know if you've ever read his work at Baylor. He wrote um, One Faith No Longer, and he's looking at blue and red America. And basically their premises are very different in what they have as their foundation. But his point was, and, and I love this about him, is he calls balls and strikes. 
if he sees it on the left, he calls it on the left. He sees it on the right, he calls it on the right. And he's he's a Christian too. So he's always trying to call, what does the word of God say? How do we interpret this? What part of the word of God has gotten that attention to the exclusion of the other when they should be held together and not contradictory? It's not an easy part to do, and especially of our society. Now, I am curious, um, as you're going about this and you see this played out, of course, you're in the, the D.C. area. You're right in the heartbeat of all of these different things. But as our culture has become much more diverse and we see the nations that are here, God bringing the nations, in my opinion, is for one of two reasons. One, we see that many of them coming are Christians and they're actually renewing many churches. Um, but we also see there's an opportunity to reach and yet we see that the political part can get in the way of that witness as we're interacting and trying to cross these borders. Do you have any thoughts on that? Just politically, what does our stance do? I mean, you've already mentioned the public wit nature of witness, but even in the cross-cultural ethnic um, separations that we see, how do we then help cross those borders and help other people that are of our own ethnic persuasion to see that the mission actually exceeds that the political difference that's there? You have any thoughts on that? I know that's not in your wheelhouse per se. You're not a missiologist, but I, I'm just curious if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a it's it's a nice way to think about it, and um, I'm not sure that the, the well, I'm sure they're not particularly profound. I don't know how, how, how helpful they are. Um, what resonated with me is uh, one is I think that that, that notion of breaking down the barriers is such a profound one that really was the, what Jesus was doing. And Paul uses the language of, of breaking down the barriers, the cultural barriers and so forth. That's one of the reasons why to me, uh, the, the whole concept of Christian nationalism, at least in its more toxic form, is such an anathema to to Christianity and certainly New Testament Christianity, um, because um, that was really what Jesus was pushing uh, against, it was mm -hmm. this notion of, of nationalism and identification uh, through, you know, through, through, through culture uh, or, or, or through other, through other things. And it was the notion of breaking down the dividing walls, uh, among us. So, you know, when I think about Christian nationalists, my response is you could hardly think of a figure that would be more against Christian nationalism than Jesus, you know, based on his, on his, um, uh, on his, on his ministry, but there's so much to learn from people of different cultures and experiences. You know, we all come at, at, at things with a certain angle of vision. Um, and there's just no way that we have the capacity to see truth and reality and events um, in, in their full scope. Uh, and so what you need is you you need to be in community and conversations with people who see things different than you. And it may be political, it may be cultural, it may be ethnic or something else. But hopefully a lot of listeners on your on your show could be able to mention experiences that they've had where they've talked to somebody with a different culture, different, really a profoundly different life experience. Mm -hmm. And they begin to talk about how they see certain things. And then you begin both to understand why they see the world the way they do, given their experiences. And then you will hopefully also see refine and recalibrate maybe your own views in light of what you, of what you, um, what you learn. Um, so th that notion of, of being in the midst of people of different nations, nationalities, ethnicities and cultures, I think is, 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 um, is, is a, can be a profound one. It's not an easy one. And as you oh. already alluded to in that, keeping those relationships listening, but I, you, you said something else I, I was a little bit curious about because Christian nationalism is obviously in the news. I actually went and I, I purchased the text on Christian nationalism because I wanted to make sure that I was understanding exactly what was being communicated. And the argumentation um, was, 
I, I don't know if you've read that book that the the little um a manifesto i've got it even here it's a it's it's a kind of a scary cover quite honestly uh just reminds me too much of nazi germany and just looking at it not to bring that in too further but it's just very stark with a black cover and a red cross right in the middle of it and in the book they said every christian is a christian nationalist in that you are to help for the flourishing of society in every sphere you're to help restrain the evil and to help the good they cite all of the different documentation at the foundation of the 13 colonies and how they had Judeo-Christian faiths codified, of course, before they became the actual original, you know, states. How do we help people to see and respond to that in the midst of the society? Because according to the great dechurching, if I if I'm I'm gonna I hate to pull stats out of the the nowhere, they said 20% of evangelicals think that we should be a Christian nation. How do we respond to that? How do we live that out and help them to see the the error in that? I mean, you've talked about it already a little bit, but can you just elaborate a little bit further? Yeah, w- the one thing I'd say is uh, uh, I'd want to be a little little careful uh, potentially and ha- have maybe a caveat when when these uh, polls about Christian nationalism are used. I think there are more toxic and less toxic forms of 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 Christian nationalism. I think for some people, it's almost a synonym for patriotism. It's it's love of country, and even if people say, "Look, you want uh, the country to be more Christian or a Christian country," I think for a lot of people, the, what they are thinking about is that there's a Jewish and Christian moral ethic mm-hmm. uh, that 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 existed and was certainly influential in the founding of the country. They believe it's a correct moral ethic, that it's objectively true, and so they want the country and the institutions of the country to to reflect that. That's not necessarily problematic, depending on how it plays plays out. Then you have uh, the 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 more toxic form um, of of Christian nationalism, which is almost a, a, a theocracy, and you have. I think the the assault on on truth and history that you see from David Barton, for example, you know, when the the Jefferson lies, sort of taking Jefferson and turning him into some kind of Orthodox Christian, um, and that I think is is problematic and and even dangerous. And the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, uh, is, is very much shaped by that by that that view. You know, in terms of what you do about it. I mean, this is a, this is true. I think in politics in general and theology in, in in general. I mean, there are some people that you're just not going to convince. Um, they're 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 zealous, they're energized, um, and they're they're on a mission, and they're not particularly open to hearing other points of view, and in fact, may even have convinced themselves that the different points of view are are evil. You know, being driven by by sort of satanic forces, um, that this is children of light, children of darkness. And they believe that they're on the right side. There's absolute certitude. They're on the side of God. The other people are enemies of God and they have to prevail. Now, when you're dealing with that kind of mindset, there's not a lot that you can say, you know, to win, win, win people over. You're probably going to, you know, want to save, save your breath. And if you engage in a debate with somebody like that, and they're a friend, then it's going to strain the friendship. You're probably going to spend a lot of time trying to repair the friendship. Uh, so you have to kind of have discernment in the person that you're that that you're that you're dealing with. Assuming you're you're dealing with people who are who are reachable, one way to potentially do it is 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 a really kind of serious um, exposition on the nature of Christ and Christianity and the New Testament within that arena and you know presumably you there are enough christians who really do want to be faithful we all struggle we all fall we all see things imperfectly but i do think that if if it can be framed which is we want to be more devoted and faithful followers of christ so let's come to this with as much theological and intellectual integrity as we can to sort of sort through, let's try and figure out what the Bible is saying first of all, mm-hmm. um, and then once we figure that out, how our views and this moment can align better with with that. So I think it has to be non-threatening. 
It needs to be uh, framed as come, let us reason together. Come, let us learn together. We, we all bring baggage. We all bring presuppositions. Um, let's see what's, what's really being said. And if that can be established, I think then there's some room to be able to pull people in to see the truth and the reality of things. Now, obviously, if, if, if you were a Christian nationalist and you heard me say what I just said, they they say amen brother and they so they they think i'm the person that needs to be you know changed that that uh maybe that they can invest in my life and maybe they can say let's go through and and ascertain what the bible says and then maybe pete because he ostensibly wants to be a follower of jesus will shift his views to be more you know more like mine so we all have to struggle with that we think we have the truth that's the reason we hold the certain views that we do so there really does have to be a kind of uh, epistemic humility, um, and, an, and it's it's a it's a funny thing. I don't know if you've if you've noticed this, but you know the the very people, the Calvinists, people in the reform tradition, who should who would talk about uh, total depravity um, and the all encompassing effects of sin including the noetic effects of sin, the, the effects of sin on, on the mind and the intellect, they would, they would absolutely say amen to that. And yet in, in everyday life and their own approach, I think th that is often missing. That is, there's the assumption that not only is the Bible inerrant, but my interpretation of the Bible is inerrant because the Bible is very, very clear. And, um, and, and, uh, in fact, I think the Bible is often confusing, and there are contradictory theologies depending on what moments that you're looking at, and so, and and so forth. But it's the it's the absolute certitude that I think gets in the way of 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 a lot of us, you know, in the in the Christian faith. So we have to be open to the knowledge, which is, I suppose, its own avenue to explore theologically to the notion that that uh, that our our intellect. Uh, and our field of vision are flawed, you know, are flawed too. We have to be open back to Lewis and Barfield to, to learning from each other. Well, as you said, and I, I mean, you're almost quoting Paul says, we know in part and we prophesy. Right. Uh, and, and there is that part, um, of course, that's there. We don't know everything. I mean, we do believe the truth of who Jesus is. We do know that, but every aspect of doctrine and how that plays out and how, it affects every single person. We know with what we have of that scripture, but you and I both know that as you mature over time, certain doctrines, depending upon the, the experience that you've gone through, becomes a lot deeper. Yeah. And your view is challenged and you are forced to go even further down into the very person of, of Christ. I think of, again, like you mentioned Keller, and I remember him saying one time, he goes, 10 years ago, I was an idiot. And he right. said, 10 years before that, I thought I was an idiot. And he goes, you know, that means now that 10 years, then me 10 years from now is going to think I'm an idiot now. <laughs> that's, exactly, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's interesting. You just ask yourself, like, if uh, you or I um, were women who lived in the 14th century in a different continent, would we interpret the Bible differently? Well, of course we would back to some of the topics we talked about, which is we're all shaped by these experiences. We would all uh, recognize that. And we, we would all look back and say, okay, I understand why Jonathan Edwards um, tragically uh, and regrettably, deeply regrettably, believed that slavery could be justified by the Bible. Mm -hmm. But that was true of most Christians and most people for 14, 15, 1600 years. They were shaped by their culture and it was deformed and it led them to an immoral position. Thankfully, we're, 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 we're not there anymore. Uh, but, you know, therefore, but for the grace of God, go, go, go I. So we can all look back and say, yeah, I can see how, how culture and, 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 uh, a lot of different things went in to lead people to believe false things. But somehow when we think about ourselves in this moment, we're exempt. Yeah, exactly. We just think, well, now we've arrived at the truth and we see everything the way it is. 
And, um, you know, a hundred years from now and 500 years from now, people are going to look back at us and they're going to say, how on earth could they have believed this? Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we're blind to it, but that's, that's part of the human story. So, and part of the human story is enlightenment, moral enlightenment, intellectual enlightenment to try and learn and to perceive truth and perceive God in, in better and clear ways. As we're coming near to the end of our time, I'm, and thank you so much, by the way, for being so generous. Sure, I enjoy it. Thanks. On the show. I, I love this conversation. I mean, I'm sure we could talk all day because there's so many other questions that I have. But in the sphere that you're in, as a Christian, what do you feel that God's calling is for you where you're at right now? Yeah, you know, it's it's a good question. I've I've never been somebody who felt a lot of assurance on what what a, my calling was in a narrow sense, you know, called in a in a particular profession or a particular job. Um, I just never really thought that way. And I, and I've at least never received messages that to me were anything more than potentially intuitions or desires, human desires that, 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 that I have. So when I think about my calling, it's pretty simple. I just try and think about sort of a life of integrity, mm-hmm. a moral integrity, intellectual integrity, be faithful, treat people well, particularly people over whom you have power. Um, and just be a witness there. Um, I think professionally speaking, you know, I'm in a different position now than I was when I was working in, 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 in the White House. Um, I, I write, I write about politics, I write about culture, but I also write about faith and, and um, not just politics and faith, but really re- reflections and meditations on, on Jesus. So I've done, you know, a dozen or more for the New York Times. I've done some for the Atlantic. And then for the Atlantic, I've also done profiles of people of faith who are friends of mine, people I admire, Gary Haugen at IJ International Justice Mission, Francis Collins, Tim Keller, Philip Yancey, Mike Gerson, uh, and uh, Russell Moore and others. Um, so I, I would say that 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 is probably the most i feel like that's the most meaningful writing that i do which is the reflections on on uh on on faith i think because faith is pretty core to who who i am and who i've who i've uh who i've been and it's also a way for me often in my writing i would say to kind of work through my own questions and my own thoughts um and sometimes bring readers along with you know uh with with me um but um so i i feel like it's a real privilege to be able to write on the things that i can and to have the platforms that that i have um but i don't know if if i feel like it's 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 a calling i try i try and be faithful given the position that uh that i uh that i have but you know in the end as 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 david brooks said the things that matter are the eulogy virtues uh Mm. and and uh um those are the ones that uh, um, the resume virtues are nice, but they just aren't aren't as uh, as as meaningful. And um, so that's kind of how I think about it. I, I'm not even sure that it's the right way to think about it. It's just the way that I am, the way that I'm, the the way that I'm I'm hardwired, and and um, so I, I've just never had a really strong sense that God is calling me in this position work-wise, but I've been unbelievably fortunate in the work that I've been able to do. That's, that's, it's, that's a good testimony though. I think for many people, they don't feel that call per se on their life, but they do want to know how do they glorify God in their vocation where they're at. And that seems like you're what you're doing. I'm trying to treat people fairly. I'm trying to tell the truth. I love the fact that you mentioned to have this intellectual integrity or moral integrity and intellectual integrity is something that honestly, until you said that, not that I, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that, but just those terminology, that term, that category, the framing that you've used, I, I find it be very helpful. As we're finishing up our time together today, what is a, a water bottle that we can give our people to nourish their, to be nourished on in, in this week and during this season? Because we are entering, I mean, we're in the political season right now. It's getting ready to ramp up even further. And 
um, many people are are still weary from the last one, especially with COVID. And they're wondering, what do we do? How do we maintain this? How do we keep our faith re, um, or just invigorated the way that it needs to be? What's something that we can give to our people so that they can nourish on throughout the week? You know, I'm probably partial, maybe more partial than I should be to books, but books have, have shaped me, um, you know, shaped my life a lot and shaped my thinking a lot and my theology a lot. There's a new book that just came out uh, of a good friend of mine, David Brooks, who's a columnist at the New York Times, called How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen. And um, it's it's really, it's, it's a wonderful book. David is a great, great writer and is extremely thoughtful. Um, and he's one of the great synthesizers in, in American life today in terms of his ability to translate um, experts in different fields, including the fields of sociology and psychology. And, you know, David's on his own journey. He's, he's, he's gone as a person who was uh, of, of uh, Jewish faith and has, has, has embraced Christianity over the last several, several years, uh, while still, I think, de actually deepening his, 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 his Jewish uh, attachments as well. But David is, is, is a great voice. And, I think he's an important voice in this moment um, because this notion of seeing others deeply and being see deeply seen, we've obviously talked a lot about that in this conversation. And that's, that's a human element um, of, of, of life. Um, and that always matters. And when people feel that they are seen um, it's, it's a life giving thing. Um, and, and that book and the spirit of that book is how to do that. Um, and I think it's it's also a very good and maybe even a central thing in terms of the this political moment that that we're that we're in as um, as well. So um, I'd say that's a that's for me and probably for others of your listeners that may be a pretty good water bottle. Well, I'll have to tell David's coming on the show, so I'll have to tell him that you recommended his book. <laughs> oh, he's a Oh, I, David is a great, great guy, really a, a, a tremendous amount of fondness for him. And uh, I'm glad, glad you're going to have him on the, on the show. Yeah. I mean, maybe he'll promote your book. Maybe that's how it'll work. <laughs> My book is, I don't, I don't have a new one. So to so just uh, do me a favor and promote his book. <laughs> you have any new stuff coming out, by the way, can people, how can people keep up with what you're doing? I mean, do you have something in the works or is it all through the times and the Atlantic going forward right now? Right right now it's the times, the Atlantic. Um, I wrote a recent essay for plow magazine, Christian magazine on uh, um, why does God allow the innocent to suffer? It's, it was a reflection on Dostoevsky's the brothers Karamazov Um which actually I'm in a book club with David and we read that read three chapters together uh, on, on that, uh, on that topic. So, you know, really for the, I'd, I'd say for the next year, it's going to be focused on essay writing um, and some of it will be faith, but, but it'll be politics too. I'm of the view that, uh, that this is a really key central moment in the life of our country. And I think that an awful lot's at stake. And I just want to feel like, as the saying goes, that I left everything on the field um, in this moment. So uh, between now and next year, end of next year, I'll hopefully be able to say my piece uh, and to make the arguments as best I can. And um, and then I'll probably take a deep breath and and see what uh, what what may may come up. But in terms of following me, people can Google my name and the Atlantic and the New York Times, and um, you know they'll they they'd be able to read some of most of what I'm writing. Well, I look forward to reading it. I want to thank you again for being so generous on the time with your time. And thanks for coming on the show. It was great being with you. I enjoyed the, the conversation and thanks for, uh, for, for your ministry and, uh, and the life you're leading.